My dear friends, I warmly welcome you all to today's session of the ACCA subject F2 that is Management Accounting. As you guys know that we are discussing the concept of capital budgeting and this lecture is basically a continuation of the previous lecture in which we discussed the theoretical concepts about what capital budgeting is and who is responsible for making such kind of a budget, what are the pros and cons of creating this kind of budget. We also discussed a few important concepts that related to time value of money and also we discussed concepts about compounding. Now you guys will be astonished that we did not discuss anything like compounding in the previous lecture. So how come have we accomplished this particular concept? So if you guys remember in the previous lecture we talked about two important concepts regarding interest. Interest if we define it in the simplest manner so it is basically the rent of money that you borrow. For example if someone needs financing and he or she goes to a financial institution let's say any bank and he asks them for money so obviously they will grant that person a loan that loan will be for a specific period of time let's suppose for a period of two years and when that person is required to pay back that loan to the financial institution not only the original amount that he or she borrowed will be returned rather an amount in excess of that bor amount borrowed initially will be returned to the bank as well now the difference between the actual amount that was borrowed by the bank and the amount that is repaid to the bank is basically interest because normally it is a practice and it is the business that the banking industry is engaged in that whenever they borrow money sorry they uh, lend money they lend it on interest basis that when they will receive the amount back they will charge some rent or they will charge some interest on the amount of money that they lend it to the person or the borrower who was in need of money at that time all right so interest is basically of two kinds uh, one kind is basically known as the simple interest and the other kind is basically known as the compound interest although we have discussed this concept in detail in the previous lecture but right now I will again revise this formula over here simple interest is basically that interest that is charged as a fixed percentage on the principal amount principal amount is basically that amount that is borrowed in the first place by the borrower from the lender and this percentage also remains the same and the interest is calculated in the same manner throughout the duration the loan is outstanding with the person or the borrower for example if someone purchased two hundred thousand dollars from a bank at an annual interest rate of 10% then according to the formula of simple interest interest will always be calculated by the product of P R and N where P is the principal amount that is 200,000 in this case R is the rate of interest which is basically 10% and since this amount is borrowed for a period of 5 years so N is basically the number of periods or the number of years in case uh, of our example that this loan is outstanding so in order to calculate this interest for five years we will make use of this formula and let us calculate the amount of interest so in order to calculate this we will multiply 200,000 by 0 0.1 being 10 percent and we will multiply this by 5 and when we, will be, when we will solve this on the calculator we can find out the solution that what will be the amount of interest charge for a period of one year all right for this whole uh, uh, for this amount that is borrowed by the borrower from the lender now dear friends as I was telling you that interest is basically a form of compounding basically whenever I am talking about interest as a form of compounding so my focus is on the interest rate now the bank is obviously interested in finding out that if I am lending a sum of $200,000 to a person so what will be the appraised amount of money that I will be receiving after a period of five years obviously if I am 
investing or i am lending some amount to another person so this means that this is a form of investment that i am making and investments are always made in order to earn some return on that investment if there is no return on an investment then it should not be called an investment rather this is charity all right so if the bank is interested to know that if i am charging 10% simple interest so what will be the amount of interest that will be received and the amount the total amount of money that will be received by me after a period of 5 years so this is the formula that is used to calculate the amount of interest if we multiply it by 1 instead of 5 this will give us the interest for 1 year if you multiply it by 2 this will give us the interest for 2 years and if you multiply it by 3 and 4 and 5 so the greater the n is the greater will be the number of years for which the interest is calculated so now if i am interested in calculating the total compounded amount that the bank will be receiving after a period of 5 years so in the case of simple interest the formula would be adjusted like this p plus p r n where p again is the principal amount p over here is again the principal amount r is the rate of interest rate of simple interest and n is basically the number of periods or the number of years whatever the case may be all right the other kind of interest is basically compound interest now the concept of compound interest as you guys already know is a little complex if you compare it to the concept of simple interest it is complex because in simple interest the interest was charged by a fixed percentage on a fixed amount that was basically the principal amount that was borrowed by the lender borrower all right i'm sorry whereas in compound interest normally the rate of interest is fixed however the amount on which this rate is applied is not the principal amount after the first year or after the first period rather it is the compounded amount after every installment because it not only includes the principal amount rather it also includes the amount of interest that has been accrued by that date the formula in order to calculate the compounded amount for compound interest is compound interest let us abbreviate is uh, over here as c dot i is equals to p into 1 plus r raised to the power n where p is the principal amount r is the rate of compound interest and n is basically the number of periods now this can also be called the future value over here the future value that the bank is expecting to receive if a compound interest of 10% is charged on a loan of 200000 that it has given to a borrower at the rate of 10% for a period of 5 years so the future amount that the bank will expect will be calculated as follows future value is equals to p let me write down the amount of uh, principal amount over here 1 plus 0.1 raised to the power 5 so this will become 200000 multiplied by 1.1 raised to the power 5 and now let us calculate this sum by using a calculator 200000 into 1.1 raised to the power 5 and this is basically the compounded amount or the future value that the bank will receive when the this loan period will come to an end after the period of 5 years 322000102 so as you guys can see the amount that was originally borrowed was 200000 however the amount that will actually be repaid by this person to the bank after a period of 5 years is 322000 102 so 
the reason is that in the first installment the 10% was applied on the amount of 200,000 since 10% of 200,000 is equals to 20,000 so now this 20,000 will be added to the amount of 200,000 and now the next percentage of interest in the next year of 10% will be charged on 220,000 rather than on 200,000 alone all right so this is basically the concept of compound interest so compounding actually finds out the future value of a sum that is invested today now i want to invest in some project so investment always requires an outflow of cash in the present year in which in the year in which i am basically making this transaction and it is also known that if an investment is made today so returns will be received by me in the coming future periods mean the accounting periods or the fiscal periods other than the period in which the initial disbursement or initial investment is made all right so if i am making an investment today that will result in some future cash flows in the coming periods so obviously before making this investment it is my duty to make an estimate in order to evaluate that what will be the future value of the investment that I am making today and the future cash flows that I am predicting will be received by me in the future periods I also have to convert them into their present value in order to find what is their equivalent amount today all right so this is again the concept of time value of money that we discussed the other day as well so whenever we are talking about compounding so we are actually not always talking about interest rather sometimes we are also talking about the effects of inflation inflation as you guys might have studied in economics as well as in your acca subject f1 it is the increase in the general price level inflation is considered to be if it is basically within certain limits inflation is considered to be a positive indicator for a growing economy because this means that the aggregate demand within an economy has increased due to which people are able to pay more for goods or services as compared to the payment that they made for the same goods or services in the past all right however if inflation is basically without any check and balance and it is accompanied by unemployment and other negative macroeconomic factors and indicators so this can be very hazardous and very dangerous for the economy all right so time value of money includes compounding or compounding is basically concerned with time value of money and compounding is basically done in order to take into impact take into effect the impact of inflation on the sum of money that we are about to in invest today that will generate us returns in the future all right similarly there is an other concept that we discuss together with compounding and that is basically a total opposite of the compounding process this process is known as discounting now as compounding was concerned with finding the future value of a sum that is invested today discounting considers a sum receivable in future and establishes its equivalent value today that means the present value when we talk about compounding so compounding actually compounds or converts the present value of the sum invested today into a future value whereas when we are talking about discounting so discounting converts the future value of a future cash flow into its equivalent present value and the purpose of converting that future value into its equivalent present value is to find out that if I am receiving, let's suppose a sum of $500,000 after a period of five years. So what is its present value today? Because today's $1,000 are more important as compared to $1,000 that you will receive in the next year. Let's say after five years. Because today you can invest it at some other place in some other opportunity that you have that can result in a better return for that $1,000 as compared to 
investing in a project that will give you this and this return after that period of time. So how is that decision taken? That decision is taken by comparing the future cash flows by their corresponding present value by taking into impact the amounts of inflation and the discount rate etc. So that you can make a decision about whether a certain project is viable or not. All right. So using the discounting methods, we make two assumptions. First of all, we make assumptions that all the cash flows that take place in the current year as well as the future periods, they take place either in the start of the period or the end of the period. And the second uh, assumption that we use is that the first investment the primary investment in a particular project it is basically made in the time period zero or the year zero means that the day when that investment is made that is basically known as the time period zero and then the second time period or the first time period will be exactly one year after that date for example if an investment is made on 1st january 2021 so this is the time period zero and a time period one will be on 1st January 2022. So this is basically the assumption that the initial investment occurs at time period zero and the other cash flows start in one year's time. All right. Now, dear friends, whenever we are talking about compounding or discounting, the important thing is basically the rate of interest. Now in the question, there can be two kinds of rates available to you. One kind of rate is basically known as the nominal rate of interest and the other interest rate is basically known as the effective rate of interest. Nominal interest rate is that rate that is not adjusted for inflation. Means that if we use that rate in order to convert any future value into present value, so our results will not be reliable because they do not contain the impact of inflation. Whereas an effective rate of interest is that discount factor or that discount rate that takes the impact of inflation in the calculations. All right. So if you have provided an effective interest rate in the question, so you are required to use it in preference to the nominal interest rate. However, if the nominal interest rate is provided to you in the question, so you have to convert it into the effective rate first. And how will you do this? You will use this formula in order to convert the nominal rate into effective rate. The formula is as follows. R is equals to one plus I divided by N raised to the power N minus one where R is basically the effective rate as I have mentioned as well. I is the nominal rate whereas N is the number of periods. By making use of this formula, we can easily convert the nominal rate of interest into the effective rate of interest, all right? So as I was telling you guys about compounding, so compounding actually involves the formulas of uh, compound interest and simple interest, normally the formula of compound interest. Whereas whenever we are talking about discounting, so discounting is done by making use of this formula. Discounting is equals to present value. So it is calculated by multiplying the future value by a discount factor. Now future value is something that will be provided to you in the question. All right. So I'm just abbreviating future value as F dot V and I'm abbreviating present value as PV. So the formula for discount rate is as follows. It is one plus R 
raised to the power minus n. All right, where one is obviously a digit, a digit, and r is the discount rate that will also be provided to you in the question. And let me remind again that if in the question you are provided with the nominal rate as well as the effective rate, so you will prefer effective rate over the nominal rate. And in case there is no effective rate given and you are provided information about the nominal rate, so you have to convert it into effective rate first and then solve the question. So R is basically the effective rate and uh, you can also, N is basically the number of periods. So in order to avoid calculating this, you might also make use of the NVT tables because an NVT table actually involves the calculation of discount factor and uh, that table is also available in an appendix to your book and uh, you can also demand that table in your examination. So dear friends, this is the formula for discounting. So in order to sum all this discussion that I have made up till now in a nutshell, we make use of the concept of time value of money that includes both compounding as well as discounting in order to make decisions about whether to invest in a particular project or in a particular asset or not. And this is basically the crux of capital budgeting. So there are various techniques that are used to decide whether or not a project is feasible for us or not, whether or not a particular asset is worthy enough to be invested in or not. So obviously, in order to take that decisions, there should be some supporting evidence available or there should be some reasoning available, some justification available on the basis of which we can decide that whether we have to invest in a particular asset or a particular project or not. Whether investing in that particular asset will be beneficial for the organization or not. So in order to make these calculations or in order to make these decisions, we make use of various methods that are known as appraisal methods. All right. Appraisal is basically an evaluation. So what are these appraisal methods that we will discuss in our today's lecture? So there are basically four methods. One method is known as the payback period. The other method is basically known as the discounted payback period. The third method is basically known as a net present value method that is abbreviated as NPV. And the fourth method is basically known as the method of internal rate of return that is abbreviated as IRR. So if you talk about these three methods, so these three methods are concerned strongly with the time value of money and you will see compounding and discounting being done in these three methods. Whereas when we talk about the payback period, so the payback period is actually a method that is criticized for not involving the impact of time value of money. What payback period actually is, we are about to discuss it shortly. Payback period is basically the time a project will take to pay back the money spent on it. Let's suppose that uh, there is a project that required an initial investment of uh, $200,000, let's say $2 million. And this will generate an annual cash flow of $250,000. So what we are expected to find out, we are expected to find out that what is the payback period of this project. Again, I'll repeat the payback period as the name indicates payback period that after how much time will the initial investment will be paid back. That means what is the time in which a project will, what is the time that a project will take to pay back the money that was spent on it means the initial investment. So in case, just like the example I have given below that uh, 
the annual cash flows resulting from an investment of 2 million in a project will be $250,000. So if the cash flows are basically, you can say, even throughout the period, let's suppose that this investment was for five, five years, let's suppose, or it was for seven years. So if in all these years, the return or the cash flows that will be generated, the positive cash flows or inflows that will be generated will be the same. So then this formula is used to calculate the payback period. So the payback is calculated as the initial investment. divided by annual cash flows. I'm abbreviating cash flows over here as CF. So the initial investment is 2 million. When you divide 2 million by 250,000. So let us calculate that what is the answer for this problem. And as you guys can see, the answer is eight. This means that if an investment of 2 million is made and there is a return of 200,000 annually, so this investment will be paid back in eight years. So this is how the payback period for a particular project is calculated. So now on the basis of this calculation, you can make an estimate or you can make a decision of whether or not you can invest in this project because that project is selected that has the minimum payback period if let's suppose there are two to three projects that we are evaluating and we are considering to invest in any one of those projects so that project will be considered that has the least payback period so now dear friends this was the case we are discussing about the payback period this case that I have discussed right now and the formula that I have discussed right now relates to that case when the annual inflows that are being received by the organization, they are even throughout the maturity period or the life of this project. What do I mean by this? I mean that as it is mentioned in this example that the annual cash flows will be 250,000 for the years to come. So this means that the amount of cash flow is same for the coming years. So we can easily use this formula. But the problem arises when the annual inflows are not even. What do I mean by the annual inflows not being even? I mean that when let's suppose the inflow in year one is to 50,000. However, in year two, the inflow is considered to be 200,000 in year three. Let's suppose it is 150,000, etc. So now it is not certain that what will be the amount of inflows in the next year. So this means that the amount of cash inflow is not even throughout the year. So for this purpose, we calculate the payback payback period in a separate way. And how is this calculated? Let me take you guys to your book so that we can see with the help of an example, how the payback period is calculated for cash flows that are uneven. So this is illustration number six about the payback period in your book. Mini Limited is considering two mutually exclusive projects with the following details. A mutually exclusive project is that project or these are those projects that have similar details and basically we have to decide any one of those projects whether they are two projects three projects or more but mutually exclusive projects are all those projects that are basically in front of us as a choice and we have to make an evaluation of all those projects and decide any one out of them all right so there are two projects that are mutually exclusive project a and project b and the information about both these projects is written in front of you. So let us talk about project A first. The initial investment is of $450,000. The scrap value in year five is $20,000. So now these two values are basically 
the cash inflows these are for project a and if you talk about project b so the initial amount, uh, amount is one hundred thousand dollars sorry we got it wrong the initial investment this amount is basically cash outflow because investment is always the disbursement of cash from our pocket same goes for this one hundred thousand dollars investment in the case of project b whereas when we are talking about the scrap value so scrap value is basically a cash inflow because this is the amount that we expect to receive in the future when we dispose of this project or when the useful life of that project or that asset no more exists all right so the annual cash flows in the case of project a are as follows in year one we have a cash inflow of two hundred thousand dollars in year two we have a cash inflow of one fifty thousand dollars one hundred thousand one hundred thousand and one hundred thousand in year five whereas talking about project b so we have uh, an cash inflow of fifty thousand dollars in year one forty thousand in year two thirty thousand in year three and so on as you guys can see in the, for the year four and five assume that the initial investment is at the start of the project and the annual cash flows accrue evenly over the year so now what is the requirement we have to calculate which project the company should select if the objective is to minimize the payback period so now as you guys can see from this question that the cash flows that are resulting if any of this project is selected they are uneven because in year one the amount is 200,000 for the project A and in the second year the amount of inflows become 150 and it reduces to 100 in the coming year and same is the case for project B that the amount is $50,000 in year one it reduces to $40,000 in year two and so on as you guys can see the trend so in order to solve this kind of question in order to calculate the payback this is the format that we guys must adopt now what you have to do i'm not solving it on the excel sheet or on the notebook i'm just i just want you guys to focus on the solution that is provided to you by the book because this is a very simple format there are three columns as you guys can see the first column relates to the years the second column relates to cash flows and the third column relates to cumulative cash flows. What are cumulative cash flows? We will discuss it just in a couple of minutes. In year zero, as you guys know that investment was made for $450,000. I want you guys to reconsider the data uh, mentioned in the question above. So there is a convention. Whenever we are talking about a cash outflow, so a cash outflow will always be represented in negative because it is the payment of cash. All right. Whereas cash inflows will be represented as positive figures because that is an inflow of cash. So in year zero, that means in the today's date, if we make the investment, so this will be a disbursement of $450,000 from our pocket. So it is thereby written as a negative amount in year one we will receive an inflow of cash equal to $200,000. Now, in order to calculate the cumulative cash flow, we have to add the cash flow for each incremental year into the cash flow of the preceding year. So as you guys can see that the cash flow for first year was minus $450,000 and the cash flow for year one is $200,000. So when we add $200,000 into minus $450,000, the answer is equals to $250,000. This is simple mathematics, nothing complex in this. Minus 450 plus 200 is equals to minus 250. This is what the third column representing the cumulative cash flow is demonstrating. Coming to year two, we again have a positive inflow or you can see an inflow of cash of $150,000. So when we add 150 into minus 250, the answer becomes equal to minus $100,000. And now coming to the third year, $100,000 is the inflow for the third year as for the third year, adding 100,000 into minus 100,000 gives us zero. This means that in the third year, this investment will be fully paid off. Because in year three, the cumulative cash flows, they have actually brought this initial investment to zero. The initial investment was of $450,000.
and in year three we have recovered the entirety of these four fifty thousand dollars this means that now the future cash flows that will result in the year four and year five this will be the actual returns that will that we will enjoy because of this investment because the inflows that were resulted from year one to year three that was basically the receipt back the payback of our investment and the inflows that will be resulting in year four and year five that is basically the actual amount of uh, you can say int uh, not interest the actual amount of return that we will enjoy now let us focus our intention on uh, the project b in year zero we had made an investment of one hundred thousand dollars as you guys can refer back to the question and the cumulative cash flows also show, uh, show a negative minus 100. Year 1, we have uh, an inflow of $50,000. And when we add these $50,000 into minus $100,000, so the answer is minus 50. In year 2, we have uh, an inflow of $40,000. And adding it to minus 50, the answer is equal to minus 10. And in the third year, we have an inflow of $30,000. And when we add it to minus 10, so the answer is equal to a positive 20. Now, dear friends, this is a critical area I want you guys to focus your attention. Now, we have to make a decision as to which project is better for investment in terms of payback. Now, as you guys can see, even project 1 has a payback period of 3 years. And the project 2 also has a payback of three years because in year three we are starting to receive a return all our investment has been paid back to us in year three so now which product should be selected so dear friends now you guys have to think like management accountants too you guys know that in project a the complete investment was returned or paid back in the third year means that returns will be generated in the fourth year whereas if you talk about project b so returns have started to be generating in the third year means that the amount of investment was paid back in some way mid year in the year three this means that if we assume if you study this explanation that they have given Project B requires $10,000 during year 3 to pay back. This is basically they are highlighting. Over the third year, $30,000 cash is being received. Now if we assume that this $30,000 cash inflow that occurred evenly throughout the year. So this means that this amount will be recovered in the first quarter of the year. Alright, so this means that the payback period of this project is actually four months, two years and four months. So this means technically that the payback period of project B is smaller than the payback period of project A. So as we know that that particular project has to be accepted that has a smaller payback period. So this is the reason that why we should select or prefer project B or project A no matter the volume of cash inflows that we can see. Now another explanation can also be this. Now you guys might be thinking that if we compare both these projects project A and project B. So the value of cash inflows from project A is greater as compared to the value of cash inflows that are resulting from project B. So shouldn't it be better that we still prefer project A or project B because of the increased amount of cash inflows that are being generated in project A. So the answer to this question is that we are not only interested in the amount of cash inflows that we will be generating in the future. The important thing to consider today is the amount of investment that we have to spend today. Returns are something that you will receive in future after some period of time. Whereas investment is the amount of money that you have to spend today. And obviously it is not possible. It is not always possible that the amount that you are investing that is already available in your pocket. It is possible 
that you might borrow that amount from some bank or some other financial institution and some cost of capital will also be associated with that by cost of capital i mean interest all right so there are various factors that accountants have to consider before making an investment and that decision is taken that is basically proving to be the most optimal solution for the organization as a whole moreover another explanation for this particular query that i have just shared with you guys uh, if we prefer project b that obviously we will over project a so we also have a chance that instead of investing four fifty thousand dollars in project a we invest one hundred thousand dollars in project b and if we have surplus funds available with us that we can calculate by subtracting 100 from 450 so we can invest the 350000 dollars in some other project as well so this means that there is an opportunity cost available as well all right so these are some of the reasons why we prefer project b over project a because the first thing is that the payback period is smaller as compared to the project a the payback period of project a the second reason being that the amount of initial investment for project B is smaller as compared to the project A. And the third thing is that we have opportunity to invest in multi-dimension if we have surplus funds available being the value of initial investment of project B smaller than the initial investment value of project A. However, the most superior reason of preferring project B or A is the is it being smaller in its payback period as compared to the project A. All right. So now uh, there is, as I told you, you guys might also have seen that there is no concept of time value of money seen over here because you guys have not seen any compounding over here. Neither you guys have seen any discounting over here. And there is one concept that I'm about to share with you guys right now. Whenever there are future cash flows associated, we are always talking about discounting and not compounding because we have to convert the future cash flows into present value. And this is basically discounting and not compounding. All right. So uh, in order to make this calculation of payback period more effective, we should introduce a concept of time value of money in this. All right. So for this purpose, there is another concept of discounted payback. As you guys can assess from the name of this concept of discounted payback, this includes the concept of discounting. Now the question is basically the same. Uh, Mini Limited is considering two mutually exclusive projects with the following details. Project A, the details are the same as were in the previous example and project B, the details are the same as uh, they were in the previous example. The method of performing the solution is also the same. All right. However, there is only a little difference. And what is that difference? The only difference you guys can see over here is that there are two additional columns. The first column is with respect to the discount factor. And the second column is with respect to the present value. All right. So the discount factor at 12% is basically calculated by using the same formula I shared with you guys a couple of minutes ago. Let me just show that formula to you guys again yes this method let me just calculate it for 10 percent since the discount rate in our example is 10 percent 1 plus 0 0.1 raised to the power minus 2 for minus 1 it will be the same all right so it will be 1.1 raised to the power minus 2. Let us calculate this value on the calculator. The answer as you guys can see is equals to 0 0.82644. Now I also told you guys earlier in any of the previous lectures that whenever you face any solution that is rounded off to various decimal places you always take four decimal places for your actual solution to be accurate. All right. So 0 0.82644 and now we compare this value with the value in our book for the second year. So as you guys can see 0 0.826, this is how the discount factor is basically calculated. Now instead of calculating this manually or using a calculator, you can also look up for these values in an NVT table or the present value table. All right. So now 
वी आर सिंपली मल्टीप्लाइंग द कैश फ्लो विद इट्स डिस्काउंट फैक्टर इन ऑर्डर टू कैलकुलेट द प्रेजेंट वैल्यू एंड अल्टीमेटली दिस प्रेजेंट वैल्यू वैल्यू विल बी यूज टू कैलकुलेट द कम्यूलेटिव कैश फ्लोज अल राइट नाउ एज यू गैस कैन सी दैट द कैश फ्लो वॉज टू हंड्रेड थाउजेंड फॉर द फर्स्ट ईयर सो वी मल्टीप्लाइड इड बाई इट्स डिस्काउंट फैक्टर ऑफ पॉइंट नाइन जीरो नाइन एंड एज अ रिजल्ट द प्रेजेंट वैल्यू रिजल्टेड बींग इक्वल टू वन एटी वन पॉइंट एट सो नाउ वेन यू एड वन एटी वन पॉइंट एट इन टू माइनस फोर फिफ्टी द आंसर फॉर कम्यूलेटिव कैश फ्लो इज इक्वल टू टू सिक्सटी एट पॉइंट टू इन नेगेटिव अल राइट सो वी that in cumulative cash flow we move from initial investment downwards so that we can reach that point where we find out that in which year the entire investment was paid back and returns started to flow all right so now as you guys can see again over here in the fifth year project a now pays back in just over 4 years and project b in just under 3 years as you guys can see over here now using this method because this method is basically a more better representation of the actual grounds a more realistic approach because it involves the time value of money so according to this method and the method that we discussed previously that did not include the concept of discounting so this method is more preferable and the second thing is that the solution also differs to some extent however the overall decision that we have to take is the same because project b has a smaller payback period as compared to the project a so obviously we will prefer project b over project a so there are certain advantages and disadvantages associated with this method i want you guys to go through this when you uh, read this article from your book now dear friends there is another important thing that we have to discuss and that is basically about the net present value what is the net present value the net present value of an investment represents the net benefit or loss of benefit in present value terms for an investment opportunity you guys are already aware of the terminology of present value present value is basically the equivalent value in the today's time that means in the present time of a future cash flow that we are expecting that it will be generated and this process is done so that we can compare whether in terms of the value of money that is today our investment will be feasible or not all right so let us see how it is calculated and then i will explain what is the concept of net present value and what is the purpose of net present value a positive npv represents the surplus funds earned on a project this means that it tells us the impact on shareholder wealth now this is the decision criteria i want you guys to learn it by heart and i also want you guys to understand it any project with a positive net present value is viable means that those projects that have a positive net present value are the projects that we have to accept if a project has negative net present value so this means that that, pro that that project is not feasible for us that will not be profitable for us so we reject it and uh, reject it whereas if there are two or more projects that we are considering so that project that will have the maximum net present value that project will be chosen so i want you guys to uh, yes this is an important article what does the net present value actually mean suppose in an investment problem we calculate the net present value of certain cash flows at 12% to be minus $97 net present value using a discount rate of 12% was used and a negative present value of $97 resulted when we calculated the present value of the same figure using a discount rate of 10% we found out that a net present value is zero whereas when we used a discount rate of 8% the net present value was calculated to be equal to $108 this means that if a borrowing is made or investment is made at the rate of 12% so we will have an, a loss of $97 on this investment 
because our investment will not generate sufficient returns to even meet the break even and instead we will have a liability on our shoulders that we have to pay back the bank or the financial institution from where we borrowed the capital in order to invest in this particular project whereas if a rate of 10% is used if funds were borrowed at 10% the investor would break even means that there will be no profit however there will also be no loss normal profit in terms of economy all right whereas if the borrowing is made at the rate of 8% so this means that this is basically the most suitable cost of borrowing and the investment will be favorable that means that it will result in 108 dollars more as a return on this investment so this is basically the overall concept of net present value let me summarize it in a few sentences if the net present value is negative we have to reject that project because it will result in a loss if the net present value is zero that is a break even point means there is no profit no loss it's your choice however it is not a rational to select the project as well however if the net present value is positive so this means that this project is 100% viable for that particular organization so we should go for those projects that have a present uh, that have a positive net present value so now how is this uh, basically calculated Illustration number eight, the data is more or less the same. Middle Limited again is considering two mutually exclusive projects with the following details. Project A, initial investment of $450,000, scrap value in five years is equal to $20,000 and the annual cash flows can be seen from this, uh, the third row, uh, fourth row, sorry, uh, $200,000 in year one, $150,000 in year two and so on. Whereas the details about project B are as follows. Initial investment is equal to $100,000, scrap value in $10,000 in 5 years and the annual cash flows can be seen as follows. Now the data is I think the same uh, that we have discussed in the previous example that when we were discussing the uh, payback. So now how do we calculate the net present value? This is the requirement that we have to calculate the net present value to the nearest thousands for projects A and project B if the relevant cost of capital is 10% means that the discount rate that we have to use is equals to 10%. Let me tell you guys that whenever we are talking about uh, time value of money. So there are different terminologies that we can use with respect to the discount rate. Discount rate can also be called the effective rate of interest. It can also be called the cost of borrowing or the cost of capital, etc. So any terminology that is mentioned, you guys need not to be worried about. And what you have to do is you just have to calculate using that figure, using that percentage in your calculations. So dear friends, this is net present value calculated for project A and project B. As you guys can see again, this is a very simple format. This is why I'm not drawing it on the spreadsheet or on the notebook. So there is first column that is representing the years the second column representing the discount factor just like we made it when we were discussing the discounted payback the third column relates to the cash flow and the fourth column relates to present value how is this calculated year zero has no discount factor because obviously anything raised to the power zero is equals to you guys know mathematics cash flows in the year zero are equal to $450,000 with respect to project A and with respect to project B they are $100,000 as you guys already know from the data provided above. The discount factor for year 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 is given over here. How is it calculated? By either using the formula I have discussed earlier or you can use the annuity tables or the present value tables for this. All right. However, I do recommend that you guys must always know how are these calculated? How are the discount factors calculated? So dear friends, multiplying the cash flows with their relevant or respective discount factors, you reach the conclusion for the present value, just like we did it in the previous example. Now the 
कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ नेट प्रेजेंट वैल्यू इज दैट वी हैव टू सम अप ऑल द नेट प्रेजेंट वैल्यूज ऑल द प्रेजेंट वैल्यूज वी हैव टू सम अप द प्रेजेंट वैल्यू फॉर ऑल द इयर्स अवेलेबल एंड द आंसर दैट विल रिजल्ट द सम ऑफ ऑल द प्रेजेंट वैल्यूज दैट विल बी नोन एज द नेट प्रेजेंट वैल्यू एंड एज यू गैस कैन सी दैट दिस इज पॉजिटिव इन दिस केस सो डियर फ्रेंड्स let me tell you guys one thing again that i was discussing previously when i was discussing this example of payback with you guys i told you that initial investment is always an outflow but whenever we are talking about scrap value so scrap value is always treated as an inflow all right and all these are also inflows because there is nothing that is provided in this question that may divert our attention that these are cash outflows and not inflows all right however a question might also provide information about certain outflows that will result in the years to come so as you guys can now see that in year 5 this 120 dollars is used this is actually rounded off to the thousands means that it is actually 120000 dollars from where did this come so if you guys remember so the outflows in year 5 are equal to 100000 dollars and 20000 dollars are basically included or added in this amount for the scrap value that will be received in the year 5 so together 100000 and 20000 becomes 120000 dollars that are represented over here and now when we multiply this by the relevant discount factor so the present value results to be equal to 75000 dollars and when you sum all these present values so you result in the net present value of 74000 dollars the same process for project b and the project b results in a present value of 34000 dollars so as i told you guys earlier and it is also written in the book that we will select that project that will have the larger net present value now dear friends as you guys know the data is basically the same that was used while we were calculating the payback period and the data is the same when we are calculating the npv when we were calculating the payback period so we preferred project b or project a however when we are calculating the net present value so we are bound to prefer project a or project b why is this difference this difference is because of the choice of methodology adopted for analyzing and evaluating these projects if payback is our priority means that we are in a haste of recovering the amount of investment as soon as possible so this means that we should select that project that has a lower payback period no matter what are the long term benefits of that project whereas if you are more interested in higher returns so then we should select other methodologies such as net present value or the internal rate of return that we are about to discuss right now so what is internal rate of return internal rate of return is basically that rate of return or discount rate at which a project has a net present value of 0 means that this is a benchmark internal rate of return is that discount rate which tells us that this is the minimum acceptable minimum acceptable rate of return that an organization can accept if it really wants to earn some return on a particular investment because a zero npv means that there is break even no profit and no loss all right so now net present value is basically calculated by the net present the internal rate of return is basically calculated when we have information about net present value of a particular project before we actually go into de details of how it is calculated let me tell you guys one important thing the decision criteria if the internal rate of return is greater than the company's cost of capital the project should be accepted and if we fa if we are faced with mutually exclusive projects then we have to choose the project with the higher internal rate of return so dear friends uh over here first of all let me share with you guys the formula of uh, internal rate of return internal rate of return is calculated by using this formula L 
प्लस एन एल डिवाइडेड बाय एन एल माइनस एन एच मल्टीप्लाइड बाय एच माइनस एल now you guys will be worried that what are these alphabets that i have written in front of you so internal rate of return is basically the abbreviated uh, over here abbreviated as irr l is basically the lower discount rate whenever we are talking about an internal rate of return so basically we have to compare two discount rates one discount rate is always lower and the other discount rate is always higher this is why h is basically used as an abbreviation of higher discount rate over here all right nl is basically the net present value at l means the lower discount rate and nh is basically the npv at the higher discount rate that i am abbreviating over here as h all right so now let us come back to our book and see that how an internal rate of return is calculated so this is basically an illustration the data is about project a years in the first column and net cash flows in the second column so when all of this is calculated so it is found out that the net present value of project a at a discount rate of 10% is equals to 73620 dollars a positive npv means that this project should be accepted because it is basically a profitable project so what is the requirement the requirement is that we have to calculate the internal rate of return of project a now my dear friends we have to make a choice of an other discount rate as well this is the discount rate that is already provided to us 10% now we have to arbitrarily choose a percentage that is greater than 10% or either lower than 10% this is our choice but if we discuss this problem with context to our exam so this is not much important because they will either tell you or the choice that you make will not be actually much of uh, uh, you can say advanced level so i suggest that you guys select a higher rate that they have uh, used in this uh, example however this rate is not hard and fast rule that the discount rate or will always be given equal to 10% and you guys will choose 20% this is your choice and one of the discount rates provided in the question obviously that will be the choice of the examiner all right so over here they have assumed a discount rate of 20% you can choose 15% if you want to you can choose 8% if you want to this is again all your choice however we have to incorporate we have to calculate the net present value on this new discount rate that is basically higher discount rate in this case and as you guys can see the net present value is calculated to be equal to 25 in negative so whatever discount rate you choose as an arbitrary discount rate you should enter all the information correctly with respect to the lower discount rate and the higher discount rate all right so now making use of this formula as you guys can see the calculations being done over here in this solution the result is equal to 17.5% since 17.5% is greater than 10% that means the discount rate that was provided or the cost of capital since i told you that discount rate is also known as cost of capital since 17% is greater than 10% so according to the rule of internal rate of return this process must be acceptable so i want you guys to study these articles from your book today and try to solve these questions try to understanding because they will enhance your understanding further if you have any questions regarding net present value internal rate of return or the payback options or any other concept that we have discussed up till now in the cost of uh in the capital budgeting uh, chapter you guys are always open to ask me now there is a last concept of annuities and perpetuities annuities and perpetuities are basically again cash flows that will result in future periods an annuity is basically an amount that is a constant annual cash flow for a number of years 
it is actually derived from the word annual or annum annual means relating to a year so annuity is basically you can say a constant annual cash flow for a number of years and perpetuity on the other hand is basically a word derived from being perpetual perpetual is something that is also continuous in nature just like if you guys have studied in f1 a company is distinct or different from the other kinds of businesses because of its perpetual existence so perpetuity is an annual cash flow that occurs forever it is often described by examiners as a cash flow continuing for the foreseeable future all right so i want you guys to discuss this thing with me if you have any problem and i want you guys to first go through these concepts from your book because everything that is incorporated in these uh, concepts is basically already discussed by us all right however there are only a few differences with respect to uh, the formulas for calculating the internal rate of return that are also not much complex and very easy to understand so i want you guys to go through these formulae and the rest of the concepts are the same and also the criteria for selecting a particular project with respect to the internal rate of return or the internal uh, 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 the net present value is also the same however there is one thing that i would like to discuss over here the formula for nvt this is an important formula and this amount can also be traced using the nvt tables 1 minus 1 plus r raised to the power minus n divided by r over here r is basically the rate or the discount factor and over here if you scroll down on this page they are also explaining how you can see uh, the annuity tables all right so this is basically an important uh, reading material that i want you guys to read and develop your understanding with respect to annuities and perpetuities so this is all for today so if you guys have any questions you are always free to ask me thank you